Welcome to the Arithmetic Logic Unit and Floating Point Unit chapter of the AMD Software Optimization video series for the third generation AMD Operon processor. In previous chapters, we showed how bytes in memory were fetched and broken down into instructions. We identified where the instructions were in the byte stream, and then we decoded those instructions into instructions the processor can actually understand internally. Let's continue by examining the execution stages of the processor. The ALU, or Arithmetic Logic Unit, has three pipes, each one comprising an ALU and an address generation unit. One micro op is sent to an ALU in one position. That same position can execute an AGU on the same clock cycle, so one doesn't have to stop because of the other. They're highly parallelized. Address calculation really comes for free, no matter how complex the addressing mode is. So use complex addressing modes instead of calculating addresses manually. This is one of the benefits of the x86 instruction ar architecture. Any instruction can be executed by any of the integer units, except for a very few, such as multiplications or the advanced bit manipulation instructions. Those kinds of instructions can only be executed by particular pipes, such as position 0 or position 2 for the integer pipes, respectively. But that's something the onboard scheduler is going to decide. This is why the order in which you emit code in your compiler, if you're writing a compiler, is important to guarantee that you're going to achieve maximum execution bandwidth. For absolute bleeding edge performance, model what the processor does, even though it's out of order, because it has some limitations and it'll be picky about how it executes what's thrown at it. If the instructions are admitted in a way the processor likes, then your likelihood of achieving peak bandwidth is going to be higher. Whenever possible, replace simple multiplications with additions using add or load effective address instructions, which can execute on any pipe. Also, intermix multiply instructions with other types of instructions in order to keep all units busy while the multiplies are going on. The third generation AMD Opteron processor also includes a new sideband stack optimizer in the address generation unit. This new circuitry keeps track of the stack pointer and makes sure that all the instructions that refer to the stack pointer, either implicitly or explicitly, can go in parallel. The sideband stack optimizer breaks dependencies on the stack pointer register so that instructions like push and pop don't have to be executed sequentially one at a time. They can be executed in parallel, resulting in much higher execution bandwidth. Let's look at an example of how the sideband stack optimizer works. In this example, we'll assume the RCX register initially has a value of 1. To understand how the processor executes instructions, take a look at this simulation and let's see how the processor executes this program cycle by cycle. Here's an ALU pipeline example. Assume RCX starts out with a value of 2 and there are no branch mispredictions. Here you can see the micro op stream that is going to be executed queued in the dispatch stage of the processor. There are two iterations color-coded differently here. There are a total of 18 micro-op slots. Some of them are empty, and we're going to track how all those micro-ops go through the pipeline stages. The first thing the processor will try to do is to figure out the dependencies and execute all the instructions that don't have any interdependencies, which is usually possible thanks to register renaming. Even though you can see here that the same register that's being changed by one instruction is being used by the previous instruction in the addressing mode, thanks to register renaming, they can go in parallel. So right there, even though the processor has three integer issues to execute, only two of them are ready to be executed. The instructions with no dependencies are selected for simultaneous execution, and in each line, you can see the latency that instruction takes. In the next cycle, you see some instructions being complete. Note that I'm referring to completed instead of retired because I want to distinguish retirement as something that can happen only when you have a complete triplet. Even though I'm still working on the first instruction of one loop iteration, I can already start not the first instruction of the next iteration, but the second instruction of it. That's really the beauty of an out-of-order processor. The next cycle, you have not only the second iteration, 
but actually the epilogue of this code already being executed. Again, it's a branch instruction. It's not checking for the result of any flag, but it has to be tracked until retirement to confirm that it was actually executed. The neat thing is that right here in the execution stages, you have at one point instructions belonging to two iterations and the epilogue of that loop, which is pretty cool. Not only that, but instructions that come after the loop are already being executed. The instructions at the epilogue of the function are being executed. That's the beauty of not only out-of-order execution, but primarily out-of-order loads, which is a big advantage with the third generation AMD Opteron processor. Not only are the loads out of order, but these instructions that refer to the stack pointers implicitly are taking place in parallel thanks to the sideband stack optimizer. In the next cycle, we have the first iteration completed. When it's finally retired, it releases a line in the retirement buffer. Now we'll go through some instructions that are rather long, so you won't see much change from one cycle to another. Only as they're being retired or actually completed, you see them changing state. Again, note how many lines in the retirement buffer are just waiting there. First, because retirement is in order, and second, because microops cannot migrate from one scheduler to another. So you have microops completed here, but they're still there using up resources, and you have execution stages without anything to execute, either because of dependency chains or because there's really nothing else to execute. So we finally have the second iteration retired and also some dependencies resolved so that new microops can start being executed. Note that the exchange instruction, which is a direct path double instruction, has two microops, and execution can be done independently if possible. Even though these instructions are still being executed, another can be started at the following cycle. Remember that retirement only happens in order. Even though you have a triplet ready here to be retired, it cannot be retired until the preceding line is retired itself. Here we see the multiplication instruction. It's using two execution stages because of the implementation detail we mentioned, even though only one of the stages has the multiplier. But the multiplication can be started even though there's a store here still taking place. Again, one instruction is started every cycle and we have one triplet retired here. The preceding triplet takes precedence, so it's retired first, and only one triplet can be retired, so it will be the only one in the next cycle that is retired. The multiplication finishes, and the remaining pop is done. So in 14 cycles, the code is complete. Thanks to out-of-order loads, the load of one iteration could start before the store of the previous iteration was complete and the epilogue of the function could start much sooner. This is a significant improvement over the previous generation AMD Opteron processor, completing the code execution in substantially fewer cycles. The floating point unit is three-way, three-issue. New in the third generation AMD Opteron processors, each FPU pipe is 128 bits wide, which means that one complete vector can be processed per cycle whether the vector is single or double precision or integers of several sizes. Previous processors needed two cycles to issue a complete vector operation. These three pipes are more specialized than the integer units. One unit typically does additive operations, such as F add and of course subtract. Another unit typically does multiplicative op operations, such as F mol. And the third one, does what we call F store, but it's more than just store. There are several different kinds of operations that are done in the F store pipe. Having 128 bit wide units inside the FPU means that the registers are also 128 bits wide. Whenever you're operating on the registers with only scalars, you're really just changing part of each wide register. Depending on the code, there may be some implicit dependencies because you're only changing part of the register. 
So avoid mixing up instructions that change only part of the register with others that rely on the contents of the other parts of the same register. Also, use instructions that zero the upper bits when loading scalar data. Floating point registers can only store floating point numbers, as well as vectors of integers. Integer registers can only handle scalar integers. There is, however, the need for some operations to communicate results from one side to the other, so there is a bridge between these two sides of the execution units. However, the express bridge goes only one way. It goes only from the floating point side to the integer side. The reason is that there are many floating point instructions that generate a condition code in the flags register, and that can be tested with a conditional branch or other conditional execution instructions. That's the most frequent case, so that direction is optimized. Not that you wouldn't like to have fast communication going the other way as well, only that's less frequent, which means it's sacrificed in terms of performance. This is an implementation trade-off. Another feature that's specific to the floating point side is whenever there is a load that depends on a previous store, it doesn't need to wait for the store to go up to higher levels of the load store unit. It's accessed pretty much as if it were in a register, so it's very fast. The latency is zero, really, when you access something that you just stored and you're loading. The new processors feature improved handling of unaligned SSE data. There are two kinds of instructions for loading an SSE register, aligned and unaligned. Previously, an unaligned load would still incur a penalty even if the data was actually aligned. With the third generation AMD Opteron processor, as long as the data is aligned, there is no penalty for using the unaligned instruction. The unaligned load instruction is as fast as the aligned version of the instruction. Another new feature does away with the restriction imposed by SSE instructions requiring that vector operands in memory have to be aligned or else an exception would be raised. Even if the memory operand happens to be misaligned, you'll pay one cycle penalty, but you'll not raise an exception. Let's look at what happens cycle by cycle in the execution units using a popular benchmark and the same scheme as before in the ALU section. This is an FPU pipeline example using the stream benchmarks triad inner loop. The integer units are shown side by side with the floating point units. Note that the integer units go all the way from the bottom and up because each integer unit has its own scheduler and a macro op cannot migrate from one pipe to another. Whereas in the floating point, you have a unified scheduler and therefore a macro op can go from any position down to any pipe. The integer side is going to be very similar to the previous simulation we did. You might even guess by the latencies here that pretty much all the integer instructions have only one cycle latency, whereas the floating point ones are fairly long. We won't focus as much on the integer side because the integer side is going to go away very quickly while the floating point macro ops are still being digested. As dependencies are being resolved, we have the instructions being executed on the integer side. Here we have the first iteration of both the integer and floating point side starting simultaneously. Given that the latencies for the integer instructions are so much shorter, they go away pretty quickly. While we're at the very beginning of the floating point instructions, the second iteration for the integer side that does the housekeeping of the loop is writing the second iteration. Note that we had the load high instructions in different positions, in position 0 and 2 of this scheduler, but they end up in position 0 and 1 of execution. They can do that on the floating point side. They just go to whatever unit can execute the macro op and is available. In that case, both the add and the multiply pipes can execute these loads. And because it's pipelined at every clock cycle, we can start a new instruction. The next instruction that had no dependency at all is one from the next floating point instruction of this loop. Because it's out of order, it can start executing before the store of the first iteration begins. Between clock cycles, not much may happen, but while the floating point side is still working, the integer side is done. Two iterations on the integer side are completed while you barely started two iterations on the floating point side.
Keep your loop maintenance to a minimum. Make it efficient. Use complex addressing modes so that you don't need to have too many induction variables. If you can keep that to a minimum, the integer side of your floating point loop is not going to matter. Just focus on what's happening on the floating point side. As dependencies are being resolved, you start seeing the other instructions being scheduled. After a few cycles, you have a whole triplet ready here to be retired. It hasn't been retired because the previous triplet still hasn't been completed yet. We're still waiting for the accumulated part of the multiply add. Finally, the store may start. Unfortunately, stores are usually at the end of a dependency chain, so it takes a while until they come about. Thus, the benefit of out-of-order loads is more important, given that that's typically the last part of a dependency chain or of an algorithm. Being able to start another iteration of the same algorithm really keeps all the execution units busy. We have the first iteration already totally retired, and we have actually part of the second iteration ready to be retired. Only it hasn't because only one triplet can be retired per cycle. And finally, the store. Here we have a snapshot of code that executes for much longer. Even though you see the execution units pretty empty, just idling there, in actual, actual code you would have other iterations filling in those holes and keeping the execution units busy. After 24 cycles, you got two, two iterations completed in this loop. The first iteration was completed in 16 cycles. The second iteration completed at 24 cycles. This means the throughput of this algorithm is eight cycles. In other words, in every eight cycles, you're gonna be completing one iteration of the algorithm. Because the third generation AMD Opteron processor is much more efficient than previous generations in executing vectorized code, it has fewer macro ops to process and will thus complete the execution in fewer cycles. Also, thanks to out-of-order loads, you can actually have several iterations of the algorithm going on at the same time, something that would be serialized in the previous generation processor. As you may have noticed, the new capability for out-of-order loads offers important improvements in processing efficiency, resulting in better performance for your code. Knowing a little about how your code is executed can help you make good programming choices. Thanks for viewing this segment of the AMD software optimization video series for the third generation AMD Opteron processor. Be sure to check out the other chapters in this series as we explore software optimization techniques for the third generation AMD Opteron processor.